Some of the atheists these days have a very, very nice theory. They say because there are a lot of religions, that means that all of them are false. And they always have the same response. That's just lazy. Think about that. Think about a court with a judge and there is a killed innocent person. And a lot of people are claiming to know the killer. And the judge is saying, because there are a lot of people who are claiming to know the killer, then there is no killer. And this dead person is not dead. But the question is still interesting. How did the one religion of God evolve into becoming all of different religions and sects and gods? How is that possible? How did the messages of all prophets of God get altered this much? In this episode, we're going to answer this specific question. Let's take the history of Arabia as an example. The history of Arabia started with Prophet Noah, peace be upon him. One of his sons is called Sam. Sam is believed to be the father of the Arabs and the Hebrew people. By the way, if you hear the word anti-Semitic from now on, please understand that this is referring to the Arabs and the Hebrew people, not to the Jews. Anyway, Sam and his children, initially in Arabia, they were on the religion of monotheism, on the religion of Islam. But somehow, over the generations, this religion slowly evolved into idol worship. How did that happen? Wait for it. God sent to these people in Arabia, prophet after prophet after prophet, to revert them back into the religion of Islam. So for example, we have Prophet Hud, peace be upon him. We have Prophet Saleh, peace be upon him. We have Prophet Shu'aib, peace be upon him. All of these prophets succeeded into reverting some of the people back to the religion of monotheism, the religion of Islam. And the others that didn't comply were punished by God. But somehow again, for the second time, the religion evolved into idol worship. How did that happen again? Then God sent Ibrahim, or Abraham in English, preaching Islam and reverting people back to pure monotheism. After Ibrahim, you have his sons, Ishmael, the prophet of the Arabs, preaching Islam and teaching Islam to the Arabs. And you have on the other side, Isaac and his son Jacob, and then the children of Israel and all of their prophets, preaching Islam to the Canaanites and the Hebrew people. But somehow the message got altered again, and the religion evolved again into idol worship. How is that happening? It's like history repeats itself over and over and over again, until finally you find the Arabs idol worshippers. And then finally, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, abolished all idol worship in Arabia. So the most important question now is, how is religion evolving from pure monotheism into polytheism? Because it seems like this religion evolution is repeating itself all over history. And remember, we're only taking the history of the Arabs as an example, but the religion evolution is repeating itself all over history, all over the world. And that is exactly the title of this video, the six steps of Satan for religion evolution. Usually, it starts with a prophet preaching pure monotheism, worship on God, submit your will to him, or as we call it in Arabic, Islam, to his people. The prophet comes with signs and miracles, people believe in him, people who don't believe get punished. We all know this part of the story. But what happens after that? After that, prophet dies, or go away. Then you have the disciples of the prophet, or let's call them the saints or the role models, the people we look up to, the people we are trying to be like them, which is okay, there is nothing wrong with that. It's very important to have good role models. But then these people start to get old and maybe they die. After they die, the new generation are afraid if we don't have role models, Maybe we will get lost. Maybe we will fall into the trap of Satan and follow our desires. So how about we make pictures of the saints so we can remember that these are the role models. These are the people to look up to. Okay, that, that's not harmful. So they start to make pictures. Of course, pictures now are like digital paintings or like paintings on paper. Before that, pictures were sculptures or idols. But it's not for worship, it is just, you know, a picture of a saint, so I can, you know, look at him and remember that this person is my role model, right? That's it. No harm. 
But then generation after generation, you go to the next step. Instead of praying at home to God, you should go to the temple. There is a picture of Saint whatever, or idol of Saint whatever. You should pray next to the picture so you get more blessing. You know, the prayer is accepted if it is next to the picture. But we're not praying to the picture, we're only praying to God next to the picture. Just to remind ourselves that we should pray like this person, because you know, he, he's the one who taught us how to pray. Okay, it works, I think. And then the next step, generation after generation, people, instead of praying to God next to the picture, they start invoking the saint in the picture. So instead of saying, God, help me, please, they say, Saint, please tell God to help me, or please intercede to God for me. Like, for example, saying, you are our mother, we desire ever to remain your devout children. Let us therefore feel the effects of your powerful intercession with Jesus Christ. And then they start removing God from the picture. They start just talking to the saint, like, Saint, help me, and there is no God here. Like, for example, saying, Holy Mary, help those in need, give strength to the weak, comfort the sorrowful. Now we're not talking to God anymore. We're talking to someone other than God and asking this someone for help. Like, for example, in some Muslim communities, asking dead saints for help, like calling Madadi al-Badawi, for example, which is asking al-Sayyid al-Badawi for help. Instead of asking God, asking a dead person. When this becomes the culture of the people, this is a very, very good opportunity to turn religion into a business. Because you know what? Religion is a very, very, very easy way to gain power and to gain money. So the next step is you need to make religion more about these practices and the temple and the saints and the pictures and the idols and less about righteousness. So as long as you're doing this exact rituals to this exact saint picture or idol, you're good to go. It's not about being righteous or good or not lying or not cheating. It is about pleasing the saints and pleasing the temple. So we can say something like someone died for your sins. So as long as you confess and donate money, you're good to go. Then a group of people, maybe one man, maybe more, become the symbols of religion. They became the people of religion. Maybe priests, temple priests, high priest, pope, imams, 12 imams. Whatever you call them, these people have one thing in common. They have some weird connection with God, maybe talking to God directly, maybe having visions. Maybe they have the Holy Spirit in their house, so when they go home, they can check with the Holy Spirit what is correct or not. And this connection gives them authority to destroy whatever they want from the scripture, make something halal or haram, permissible or not permissible. For example, throughout the history of the Christian church, usury was condemned. And then because of some problems with the finance of the royal family, the royal family kept pushing on the Pope until he said, you know what, okay, usury is permissible, but only for the Jews. And then another wave of pushing, he said, you know what, it's permissible for everyone. So giving people authority to change the scripture and change the words of God, these people themselves become gods. And what happens when people accept them as their new gods? They start selling God services, like for example, forgiveness. If you send, you come to me, so you get forgiveness. You can't ask forgiveness from God directly. You come to me. And if you don't have enough good deeds, I get you. You can buy good deeds. How? You can just give us money and we will give you indulgence parchments. Or you can donate 10% of your income to the church until we become so fat we can control the whole Europe. Or you can give your money to the temple God, like in the story of Joseph or in Arabia or the temple priests will happily accept your sacrifices on behalf of God. So if you want to please God, sacrifice to him by giving us the money. Or in a modern way, we accept the donations. And as you can see here, this is how much donations can accumulate. For 
the medieval church, the need to keep a grip on their power and influence was rivaled only by the drive to make money. Church officials at all levels were primarily concerned with selling get-out-of-purgatory certificates. They also enjoyed spreading the word about how working for the church would ensure your social position on earth and reserve you a spot in heaven. Appease the idol's anger. This fixation on profit went so far, parishioners were often warned that any and all expendable income they came into possession of should be given directly to the church. Or else. And of course you have to make some kind of significance to the temple. People should need the temple, so fabricate something. Maybe say that here there is a tomb of a saint, like it is happening in a lot of Muslim countries, unfortunately. Or you can make up rules, like for example saying that you have to take permission to do zikr from the sheikh, which is unfortunately happening a lot these days. Or you can have something exclusive that is only available in the temple, like for example, blessed holy water of some kind or the blood of Christ or the flesh of Christ or you know the pictures of saints that is giving blessing to your home you have to give us the picture first and put it in holy water for two weeks and then you can take it all of these rituals the point of them is to give importance and significance to the temple priests otherwise they will be useless so you have to do something and this step is very, very, very dangerous because these people, the people of the religion, the people who represent God, have a lot of power and a lot of wealth. They can literally control politics. They can start wars, they can end wars, they can invade the whole world in the name of the cross. And no one can say to them, you're wrong because you know what? I am speaking on behalf of God. So here we go to the final step, which is the decision. People start questioning these high priests. What are you doing? Why should we follow you? Why should we obey you? Why should we make you rich? And the decision usually is one of three. Decision number one, these people become atheists. Because this high priest is a liar, therefore there is no God, and there is no meaning in life, and then you get all kinds of degeneracy that we saw in history before every nation was destroyed, and we are starting to see right now, and we will see more of it in the future. The analytic mind favors consequentialism, and consequentialism says the only thing that matters is maximizing pleasure and personal happiness, basically pumping dopamine into the brain. But sometimes maximizing that dopamine requires lying, cheating, cutting off family, betraying your community, violating sanctity, engaging in the taboo. So when atheists promote analytic thought as the end-all be-all of human cognition, they're not only burying natural human intuitions about God, they're also sabotaging all organic human relationships. Psychologist Jonathan Haidt, who is a committed atheist himself, as well as others, have published numerous studies on how atheists are less charitable, less generous to family, less loyal to community, more willing to justify lying and cheating for material gain, more willing to engage in infidelity, and much more. Atheists might claim that atheism is solely about the non-existence of God, but that's not true. Atheism is an integrated psychology that is strongly correlated with an ultra-consequentialist ends justify the means Machiavellian morality that is hostile to all human relationships. It's no accident that atheists have been at the helm of the past century's most expansive and brutal social engineering projects aimed at dismantling and radically reshaping the traditional family all in the name of the so-called greater good. Secularism institutionalizes this analytic mode of thought, indoctrinating children and adults to overcome their natural intuitions and become cold, calculating machines. It's precisely the atheistic mindset, drunken with an unhinged analytic fervor, 
that has been fueling the modernist project of hyper-consumerism and atomization that's destroying the human species by transforming us into a race of dopamine-addicted automatons. This is the pill that destroys our nature and kills the soul. We will talk about this in details in the next episode, so wait for it. Or people will do the decision number two. Decision number two is, you know what, we don't want this person. We're not going to obey these temple leaders and make them rich and powerful. But however, the saints in the temples are our gods. And then you get pure polytheism. And everyone has his god at home and idols and pictures and you know the rest of the story. In polytheism, most gods are localized with limited power. There's a god for the sea, another god for the sky, or a small god for your specific family. These are weak gods that offer you nothing. The deities in polytheism are so weak that often they can't even feed themselves. They require sacrifices in the form of food, alcohol, or blood. This is what libations are for. In many cases, traditional polytheism involves appeasing spirit beings and literal demons. For example, you make an offering to the sea demons so they don't destroy your boat. In the theology of polytheism, you get no benefit from these gods, and the only reason you worship them is to ward off their evil. How could you love gods like this or have any gratitude towards them? You might even hate these gods. Polytheistic religions have this inherent ugliness. It's the complete opposite of monotheism. Or number three, people go back to Islam. And this happens either by God sending another prophet, which happened a lot in history, or through people going back to the scripture, and of course the authentic scripture, not the fabricated one, and rereading it, rediscovering the message of God, rediscovering Islam. We see that a lot in history, and this is what we're trying to do now before it's too late. These are the six steps of Satan repeated all over history to transform Islam into complete degeneracy. And next episode will be very interesting because Arabs before Muhammad were in the last step, were in complete degeneracy. We will see how bad was the society before the Prophet, peace be upon him, and how did the message of the Prophet transform one of the worst societies in history into literally the best people who walked on earth. And of course, brothers and sisters, if you want to support our Dawah project and help spread the message of God to humanity, engage with the video with likes, comments, and shares. This is how the YouTube algorithm works. As much as you engage, as much it will be suggested to other people. And if you want to support us financially, we will leave donation links below the video. Thanks, and see you in the next episode. Assalamu alaikum.